Joining us in the sandbox today, the wizard of big data just ahead. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Prolifix Innovation Sandbox. I'm your host, Greg Hodgkinson. This is our first episode today. We'll be running a new one every week. So join us here every Thursday at the same time. Each week, we'll host different technology experts, experts who are leaders in their field, and they'll share their passion and what they see being the future of hot technologies like big data, process mining, blockchain, DevOps, and more. We also want to hear your voice. So you can submit your questions at any time during the show in the live chat, which is either just to the right or below the video feed. So stick around after we close to listen in on the Q&A. We have a very special guest joining us in the sandbox today. He is the CEO of Sensing, an innovator in AI-driven entity resolution and a leader who National Geographic have named the wizard of big data. Jeff Jonas, welcome to the Innovation Sandbox. Hi, Greg. So Jeff, we'll get started with a nice easy question. Uh, what is entity resolution? Why should everyone be as passionate about it as you are? And I guess, how does it affect the rest of us? Well, entity resolution is understanding when two people are the same or two companies are the same or not. It's like understanding who is who and who's related to who in your data. So many organizations struggle with that. They'll have three uh, of the three people in their marketing list will be really the same people. So you'll see three, uh, you know, three advertisements from them. Banks will terminate a customer in Hong Kong for being a money launderer and the same person will show up in India with a, a different passport and one letter different in their last name. And the bank has no idea. These are all entity resolution problems. And I, I specialize in that, or at least in the last couple of decades. Yeah. So you've kind of led the field. I think you're being a bit modest there. Um, <clears throat> You know, it would, it would sound like this is pretty fundamental to, to most businesses. Um, what is the, you know, can you give us a bit of an idea, maybe of what the earliest inspiration is of the work that you're doing now? Uh, and how did that end up getting you to G2 and Sensei? You know, I was thinking about that. My first company, which bankrupted when I was 20, by the way. So, you know, it's not a real bragging rights. <clears throat> but we were building custom software. I was 17. And I built a, a, a who is who, who's related to who piece of software for the North America Llama Society. <laughs> uh, we built for them their uh, genealogy tracking system that would produce llama birth certificates. <laughs> that was probably my very first taste. Now, I didn't realize that was going to become a system I built uh, for TransUnion and then a system I built uh, for 22% for, uh, of the U.S. hotels and then Ultimately, I built a system for the casinos. It became known as NORA, Non-Obvious Relationship Awareness. Uh, they really want to know who they're doing business with. And that system um, started finding interesting things. We got funded by Incutel, the venture capital arm of the CIA, and Reed Elsevier, the parent company of LexisNexis, uh, in 2003. And then 2005, IBM buys my entity resolution software, buys SRD and my team. And then G2 happened um, in 2009. I looked at, uh, I, I guess I rung up my, my boss and I said, hey, if you let me start from scratch and give me $50 million, I can build you a system that does, figures out who's who and who's related to who. It'll be self-tuning, self-learning. It'll be a specialty AI just for that. It'll work in Mandarin. It'll be geospatially aware. It'll have more privacy features than anything I've ever built, blah, blah, blah. It's like a Swiss army knife. I was uh, told to get started. We started shipping it in 2012. And then in 2016, uh, I, was, uh, I got a one-of-a-kind spin-out with IBM that IBM's never done before. So I got a 
license to my G2 invention and I got to bring my team and I got to use a hundred patents. And uh, yeah. yeah, so Senzing is not really a startup, it's a reincarnation. You see, so, we just uh, have a new birth, a new <laughs> birthday and a new name. <laughs> the same and old soul. <laughs> and it all started <clears throat> with llamas. <laughs> That's yeah, fantastic. Technically. <laughs> So maybe if you just tell us a bit about G2. So I understand its, its uniqueness is the ability to revisit decisions in real time. Uh, now, I'm sure there's a lot of complexity to that, but can you give us some insights into how it does that? Sure. So I was inspired by how to describe the way it works by a uh, magazine article that came out in, uh, in Wired Magazine. And it says AI needs common sense. And I don't know if you've seen this, but... Uh, there's been a study, you can take a picture of a school bus and change a few pixels and give it to a vision, a machine learned vision algorithm, and the algorithm will tell you it is an ostrich. And then you can take a picture of a temple or a hen and change a few pixels and it'll be, that's an ostrich. And so where's the common sense? And so that's what that uh, Wired story was about. And so what I built into Sensing, or my, and the team and I uh, built into Sensing, is a layer of common sense. Like, why should you have to train a system that Liz, Beth, and Elizabeth are, are part of the same, you know, similar names? You want to you take the time to train a system that Dick, Richard, Dickie, and Ricky are all part of the same name family? No. So common sense is we have an 800 million name trained library about all those uh, name uh, synonyms. Addresses are very difficult to parse. So you could either spend forever training a system for that on your own data, or you can have a pre-built library. So common sense is this layer where it, it, it generalizes things and understands it has some libraries. And then real-time learning is as it's seeing the values and the statistics, it's changing how it's thinking. <clears throat> and so an example of that is a pass, as, a, as a common sense, passport's a very good way to identify somebody, you know, a passport and a name. But what if the passport is one, two, three, four, five? Do you think every Mark Smith with passport number one, two, three, four, five is the same? And the answer is probably not. So Sensing does, uh, it knows that passports are good identifiers, but then when it realizes a lot of people have the same one, one, two, three, four, five, it does two things. It says, I'm not going to make that mistake in the future. And then it says, I'm going to go backwards in time. And over the billions of decisions I've already made, I'm going to see if I should have made any of them differently. And that's actually one of the most unique properties is in our real-time learning system is you, it doesn't have to do that in batch. Most machine learning uh, models out there, you have to build them in batch. So we discover those things in real time and change our mind about the past. <clears throat> this is a human property, by the way. Like somebody will be talking to you, blah, blah, blah. You're like, oh, I know what they mean. And then they'll say a few more words. You'll be like, oh, I know what they meant. And that's the same thing. I built that <clears throat> into Sensing. So I would imagine the technology to make that occur in real time must be fairly significant. I would like to call it expensive. <laughs> it has taken, it's, it, it's taken a lot of time, but it's, yeah, and it has cost a lot of money to make it do that. Yeah, to do it at thousands of transactions a second. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah you, like you've seen a billion things, you've made a billion decisions, you get record billion and one. You have to ask yourself, now that I know that, had I known that in the beginning, over the yeah. billions of decisions I've made, should I have made any differently? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so you think it has the guardrails built in as well to actually apply common sense? Yeah, I have sorted that out. But, and what, what I did is, I, the method that we use is, it's inspired by, I did a blog post at once about uh, this called them Hell with Rules. Okay, I'll explain it really quick. I went to go meet uh, this lady. She ran fraud for a, a, a credit card company and I, I show up to visit and she goes, I know who you are, Mr. Jonas. I just want you to know before you say anything, we have 10,000 rules. She's bragging about it, okay? And I'm thinking to myself, oh, that's not right. But I couldn't articulate it. It took me three months to figure out how to explain it. And here's, the, here's my explanation. You catch your kids throwing rocks at cars. So you say, hey, don't throw rocks at cars. But the next day, they're throwing rocks at buses. So you're like, hey, don't throw rocks at buses. The next day, at SUVs. Your kid is 35 years old throwing iPads at people riding Segways. I mean, how many rules do you need? 
it turns out you want to be able to encapsulate a principle like, hey, don't throw things at other people's stuff. Maybe with some exceptions, like they're running at you with scissors. So I did that blog post. By the way, that's like having to be stung by every kind of bee, every size, every shape, and every color marking. You keep getting surprised, right? Because you don't have a principle about just, you know, see a few bees and kind of get the concept. So I blogged that. I saw uh, her a year later, and she looked at me with her hat in her hand like this going, we have 20,000 rules. <laughs> <laughs> so what used to happen in my prior entity resolution work is you have these rules or these combinations of things, a name plus a passport plus a date of birth. If you have a name and a, and a phone and a date of birth, and you just have different combinations. What if it's just a name and an email, blah, blah, blah. And as you add more fields, you have more combinations and different weights between the combinations. What's more important, a date of birth or a passport. I got rid of all of that. And what I did is I, I thought about how people entity resolve uh, data about persons and then companies and then how do you do cars and how do you entity resolve routers. Routers have makes and models and IP addresses and MAC addresses and colors. And instead of thinking about each one this way about each of those domains, I thought about it across this way. I was like, how is a social security number like a VIN number on a car? And that mental exercise led me to uh, what's now called principle-based entity resolution, where one set of principles allows it to do people, companies, vessels, planes, asteroids, without any changes. It's <coughs> radically different than anything else. Anyway, I don't know. That's maybe the long version. Yeah, well, that, that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> so the... So I guess if you think about data underpinning all of this, the, uh, the, the importance of data to organizations is constantly evolving, as I'm sure you, you, you don't need to be told. So it's all, you know, we've gone through e-commerce and B2B and now everything is social now. So all this data that's out there, uh, if you look into your crystal ball, where do you see, <clears throat> see things go? I think uh, the data gets better connected. And I think as we better connect the data we already have, that there's probably a lot of uh, hidden connections that would be really valuable discoveries and down to the, down to the micro level, like realizing it's not three customers, it's one. So you can give them better service all the way to the macro level, like better connecting data between two researchers to speed up drug development. Now, now I, want, I want to bring that. So I want to uh, ask everyone to stick around for the Q and A, because I'd like to expand on that and throw a, a few questions in around that that interesting topic. Uh, let's talk about Iron Man for a moment. So uh, you've completed every single Iron Man circuit worldwide. So every every recognized circuit. How did you discover your love of Iron Man? Well, it started with my mom uh, asking me when I was thirty-one if I wanted to run a marathon with her, and the marathon was five weeks away. And I'd never run a race. I'd never, I wasn't a runner. I trained for five weeks. I could, the most I got up to was 11 miles on a treadmill. So I did the marathon with my mom and then she beat me. <laughs> Every, at mile 20, I started walking. Are you ready to run, Jeffrey? <laughs> no. Are you ready to run? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, then I did a, a short Ironman in, a, in the mountains on a mountain bike. So it was kind of an eclectic little race, not an Ironman, but a triathlon. And then I ended up doing a half Ironman with my mom about three years after the marathon. And I'll just tell you this straight up. I crushed her. <laughs> <laughs> I beat my mom so good <laughs> on that half Ironman. Uh, sorry, mom. Just kidding. <laughs> well, okay. And then, um, then I did a full Ironman and then that uh, was kind of hard. And then, um, then I did another and then I just started picking different ones to do around the world. And my buddy was like, hey, why don't we do Switzerland again? I was like, no, I'll just do them all once. But I didn't mean it when I said it. I just, it was an excuse. So I just kept doing new races around the world. And I think it took 10 or 12 years, but I got them all done. Now I just have to do the new ones. <laughs> so, it's, it's, <laughs> so, you know, Iron Man is not for the faint of heart. And it's um, extremely different from your day job. But it's also something that requires intense dedication. Um, you, you know, it seems to me you approached it methodically. So what nurtured that methodical nature in you? <laughs> I don't know that it's methodical, man. I only swim on race day. <laughs> you know, my little flappers just are so angry five minutes into every swim. Um, I'm more of a hacker on the Ironman. But I, I am a bit of an extremist. I do, 
I do like getting deep into things. I, when I helped uh, the Singaporeans on a, a project to uh, figure out what vessels are the most interesting on any given day in the Malacca Straits, I, I spent 500 hours studying that. When I worked with the big global bank in the last few years uh, on money laundering, I spent 2,000 hours studying that. And I, I personally wrote a 250 page blueprint, like pseudocode of exactly how to build it and reduce you know, the false positives in their alert center. So anyway, I, I, I can get committed and focus and stare at one thing for a long time, but the rest of my life's pretty ADD. <laughs> so, uh, so it's all about being able to ingest large amounts of data and discover the patterns, right? So uh, sounds yeah, sounds familiar. Actually, <laughs> actually, you know, right now in your background, there's probably maybe not right this moment, but maybe there's some background noise. Maybe there's some imagery moving behind the windows. Um, it's actually the ability to know what you don't even need to process it turns out to be really important as well because your observation yeah. space is enormous, but all the background noise is uh, not being processed at all. But if you heard a bang outside, you know, is it a firecracker? Did a car, old car backfire? Um, then you would notice that and then you would become selectively curious. You'd look out the window to see kind of what's going on. That's actually one of the things I hope to get built into sensing uh, uh, in the next uh, year or two is selective curiosity. It figures out when something's worth being curious about and then goes out and looks for it on its own. So <laughs> it does. <laughs> that's gonna keep, I'm sure that's going to keep you busy for a while. Um, so it does bring up the question. So it, it sounds like you are, there's a thread of thought, which is you're trying to get G2 and sensing to automate what we as humans can do, but in what sense do you think that it'll be able to, or it can or will be able to do things that we can never hope to do with our technology? Well, it, it already in most cases outperforms humans. Like when our, our partners use it, they, they say, hey, you missed a few things, but you caught so many more things we couldn't catch. We would have missed. So it's already outperforming the humans. So, uh, well, what I'd like to do at this point, uh, Jeff, is in addition to the Iron Man that you are in this discussion, I'd like to welcome Prolific's very own strongman, Matt Goss. Uh, <laughs> I'm now flanked by intimidating athletes. Matt, welcome to the Sandbox. Great. Thanks, Greg. So, Matt, I believe we're doing some work with Jeff and Sensing for a customer at the moment. Can you share a little bit of, about that story and maybe uh, chat to Jeff about it? Yeah, certainly, certainly. So, uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Um, so, Amen. we're currently working today on a joint project together in the uh, the financial services industry, which is uh, you know targeting sensitive data to mitigate risk. Um, what other use cases uh, do you cover in the industry? Uh, there's three general use cases. One is bad guy hunting. It, it happens to have been my favorite over the years. Uh, is how do you catch clever, very clever bad people in data? Uh, but bad guy hunting is either you have a, a list of known bad guys and you're trying to find them in your data, or you're trying to find them altering their identity and sneaking in, uh, or you're trying to figure out who's who so you can find new patterns that would help indicate it's, it's somebody that's doing bad stuff like fraud or money laundering. Uh, we also get used for what you might just call a customer 360. It's just better knowing the whole customer across all their relationships. And you need that so you can give them better, better customer service. You can market properly to them. Um, uh, another one is risk assessment. When you, whether you're hiring people or getting ready to give somebody a loan, you're about ready to make a decision that's hard to un, undo. You want to be able to make a good qualified decision about the risk or opportunity of an employee or a vendor or a customer. And then uh, GDPR is a great one. One of the things that GDPR and the, and the California law called CCPA is um, it's called a data subject access request. Imagine somebody coming and asking, uh, doing a data subject access request, and they say, my, my name's Liz Reston. Do you think the bank's going to have the person search their 30 or 300 systems for Liz Reston, Elizabeth Reston, Beth Reston, Lizzie Reston? And so any resolution helps solve that as well. So those are some of the common uh, use cases. Wow. That's amazing. That is definitely amazing. 
So I know we're, you know, we're running close on time. We want to be able to, uh, you know, allow some other folks to be able to ask some questions uh, that are watching this. So I'm going to ask you one more question, but I think it's extremely okay. relevant to the, uh, uh, the new world that we are, uh, we're all living in. So, you know, given the fact that the current pandemic has really thrown um, a massive wrench uh, in the business world today, uh, we're all evolving. Uh, we're trying to address it. And, you know, the one big thing that is continuing to pop up, at least I know when we're talking to customers, anything we're seeing, it's, you know, all centered around cost optimization. So how does Sensing help companies reduce their spend across their enterprises? Uh, two primary ways. One way is you would be surprised how many companies are trying to build their own homegrown entity resolution. You know, on the surface, it sounds really easy. How hard could it be to just match names and addresses? There are companies out there that have 100 full-time people working on that, 100. And those are the bigger companies, uh, uh, data brokers, for example. But so um, why would people build their own database anymore or write their own word processor? Like what Sensing's purpose is to commoditize and democratize entity resolution. So it's not only for the elite, a small nonprofit that's got duplicates in their marketing list. Um, uh, what are they gonna do? So we're, uh, we're solving that, um, and that's a big cost takeout. You can get returns on investment in, in months, if not weeks. And the other one is when you can match identities better, you can uh, reduce the number of false positives in alert queues, for example. So we have one financial institution. I think, I'll know in a few more days, but I think they get to uh, take 10 people out of their um, alert processing fake alerts, you know, alerts that aren't real, false positives, and they can reapply those people elsewhere in the organization. So that's huge savings as well. So reduced false positives and no, no longer a need to have a, a bunch of people building their own entity resolution. So I know I said I had only one more question, but I'm gonna ask you one more, just simply because, you know, what you said is really spawned some really interesting, uh, you know, thoughts in my mind about some of the customers I know that we work with and uh, that's in the, in the healthcare industry, especially within the healthcare insurance, you know, being able to, uh, to spot fraud, um, you know, uh, really being able to mine the claims that are coming in. Can you talk about some of the use cases maybe in the, in, in the healthcare insurance space? Yeah, we're, we're in that space, by the way, in, in that exact uh, use case that you're mentioning. You know, you're, you're looking for providers that are, uh, have been uh, barred, who are trying to still end up in the ecosystem, uh, healthcare providers. Uh, you're trying to find people that are, uh, you know, abusing the, abusing the system. And so our um, healthcare partners are loading all kinds of data. What you really want to do is you don't take a like data set A and check it against B and, and then take data set A and check it against C. What you really do and what sending does, it allows you to get visibility into opportunity or risk is you take each person, uh, and organization across all these piles and you bring all of that data in when we, and with each arriving record you say hey who is this so you end up building a resume you end up with a resume that says hey this one person actually is in seven systems and he's in this one system six times and we do one other little nuanced thing it's called entity centric learning we learn every name variation they've ever used every address they've used you know we're building a resume of how they've expressed themselves. And it turns out if you don't do that, you can't catch clever bad people because clever bad people never use the same name, address, and phone on every record. <laughs> Only the idiots do that. <laughs> so entity if you're doing anything with fraud, you really have to use entity-centric learning, uh, which is building a resume and remembering all, all of the variations. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I mean, I could sit here and ask you uh, about a hundred more questions, but I know we're running on time. So uh, Jeff, thank you so much. I mean, this has been very, very informative. I really appreciate it. Um, Thanks, man. Greg, I'll pass it over yeah. to you. So that's all the time we have uh, for this week. Um, Jeff, Jonas, uh, thanks for making our first show truly memorable. Uh, to say thanks, we have a, a little surprise for you. We have a small gift to remind you of your time in the, in the sandbox. Uh, I'm hoping you'll be able to <laughs> <laughs> See it on the screen. <laughs> hey, is it a hairpiece? You know, COVID <laughs> targets bald men. So if you could send me a hairpiece, maybe COVID will uh, look the other way. Yeah, we seem to have all uh, fallen foul of that particular uh, issue. <laughs> uh, 
Anyway, so I'm not sure if it's, if it's not visible on the screen right now, we, could, um, we can show it to you afterwards. There it is. Okay, fantastic. So, Jeff, I mean, it's a, a privilege to have spent some time with you over the last half an hour. It was a, a pleasure spending the last half an hour chatting to you. Um, I just want to say thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So I do have a quick question. How did you get the, the, the name Wizard of Big Data? <laughs> it's not even true. <laughs> I don't think it's true. Um, uh, National Geographic did an innovator series and they picked like one person from geology, one person from physics, one person from different fields. And I somehow got picked to uh, be the innovator around, you know, data and uh, technology. And so I did this interview. It was two day interview. Uh, and uh, when the story came out, they just called me the wizard of big data. I'm like, what? I I like to I like to underclaim uh and so you know I don't know I can't undo that but kind of stuck there there are bigger wizards than I in big data well Q, Q and A is still coming up so maybe we'll uh, if we if we cover something contentious you might get a new nickname <laughs> oh that's great <laughs> All right. Well, I just want to thank uh, thanks to you one more time for joining us today. Thank you uh, to our audience for uh, you know great having you all spending time with us in the sandbox. Um, just a quick shout out. Next Thursday, where um, the 16th of July, we'll be taking a bite out of data with Ernie Ostick of Manta and Rolf Himes of Talent. So until then, keep well, keep innovating, and stay with us for a little bit of Q and A with Jeff. Excellent. <laughs>All right, so for our audience, we're now going to put you in charge. Let's see what questions you have for Jeff. So just as a reminder, you get to submit your questions in the live chat, which will either be to the uh, bottom or the right of the video feed. Uh, my producer will hand them over. So uh, I think we have some good questions coming through. And I must admit, Jeff, I feel a bit like a TV psychic medium um, expecting questions to come through for you. So you never know where these questions might come from. Um, <laughs> The first one is from Marco Lopez. So can common sense in AI identify intent? Uh, if rules are set up to identify elements of a crime, oftentimes cases are dropped for lack of criminal intent. So that's part one. And I'll just mention, so, but if principles are identified <laughs> in the algorithm, can we clearly identify the intense resolution that would be game changing? Well, my work ends with are they the same or not and does not include is that good news or bad news like if you're like oh billy is william and billy is billy the kid and if billy the kid's william what well, how bad is that that's that's the next thing that happens after my work i used to do uh work in that space by the way the red light green light or the risk scoring but it never made my team and i special um, but I think it's having, and I do a lot of work in the privacy community. I think algorithms that would try to glean intent is a pretty risky space. And the consequence yeah. of false positives are, are, uh, it's really, uh, really bad news. I don't know if you saw the story that came out about the facial recognition algorithm that made a false positive and some, um, unlucky man got arrested for a facial recognition algorithm false positive. And uh, they, they can really affect people. So I'm, I'm really would be very cautious about trying to glean intent uh, out of data. Unless of course, I'll give you an exception. <laughs> you overheard them <laughs> say, on Thursday, I'm going to head over there <laughs> and kick some whoop ass. <laughs> that would be intent. So I think, uh, I think that, yeah. So, so you kind of stick to the things that are more objective and leave the more subjective predictions to, uh, to others. Would that be a fair summation? I'm, I'm just focusing on things we figured out that, that made us most unique. I'm trying to do that, that part. Uh, yeah. 
So uh, <clears throat> I've got another one come through. It's, I guess it's more of an observation than a, than a question of uh, many insurance companies today. This is from Omar saying insurance companies today, he'd love to have had your technology because they only look at bits of data instead of building a resume. So I guess you know, not, not oh. as much of a question, <clears throat> but yeah. Well, you know, but can I comment on that is yeah. one of the ways I've described my work is, you know, the difference between puzzle pieces and pictures. A lot of organizations take a single transaction. Just think of it like a puzzle piece, right? Somebody who's got a blood test, it's like a puzzle piece. A lot of organizations take transactions and then put a whole bunch of algorithms on that one puzzle piece uh, to try to figure out if it's good news or bad news. And there's a point you can't squeeze any more knowledge out of it. It's just a puzzle piece. And only if you take the puzzle piece and see how it relates to other puzzle pieces, do you get the context. Context meaning better understanding something by taking into account the things around it. So when you can com combine data uh, about related uh, people or organizations or things, it gives you more complete pictures than, you, than it allows you to make higher quality predictions of opportunity or risk. Do you think there's actually, are there any limits to what could usefully be digitized to give you more and more context? I mean, you were talking earlier about um, wanting to increase the pool of data and I think you were talking more about historical data, but it just seems to me that there's, there's no, um, potentially there's no limits on what could be digitized to then inform your context to give you useful insights that you may not understand um, or even be able to uh, you know, understand once you've got those predictions, but could still be useful. Well, certainly the world is becoming more and more instrumented. In fact, you know, the humans, the sensor now, like we go in and tag things and vote things up and down and, we notice things and tweet them. So it's like the humors and humans are now part of the, the sensor grid. You know, another interesting, just back to the privacy piece is, you know, who has access to put the data together and is that transparent? You know, and is it being used uh, for you in a way that you would permit and be happy about? Or is it being used in a way that you're like, hey, I didn't know it was gonna get used that way. By the way, I have decided that the surveillance society is inevitable, it's irreversible, but more interestingly, it's irresistible, and you're doing it. You know, when you go use a free email, if you go read the, the, the user terms, it would likely say things like, all the data is ours, we get to keep it, even if you delete your account. But it's so irresistible. So that, that's what the, that's the future is, more and more uh, surveillance because it's being made irresistible. And we keep buying more and more connected devices to make us more connected and more trackable and, uh, and you know, share more of our data that's out there. So, You know, the day we lose GPS because of some, I don't know, asteroid or I don't know, whatever might cause GPS to go down. You know what? There's just going to be a bunch of human beings standing still going, <laughs> So I told you uh, earlier on, <clears throat> I was going to see if I could, I could uh, work in a question that included chaos theory. <laughs> so let's see how this goes. So we all know what the, the, the butterfly effect, you know, if the, uh, mm. uh, a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, um, you, does it cause a tornado in Texas? Um, to, to what degree, I mean, again, to the, the limits of AI to be able to, to do things that people can do and then and things that people aren't even, it's not even possible for us to do. Um, are there any limits to what AI can predict and, and how does that kind of chaos theory play into it? I mean, there, there, there sounds you to know, be I think, very <clears throat> real things that it would be up against. I think AI is, is a bit overhyped. I think there's areas it's, it's working very well. There's other areas where it has epic fails. So I think it's very um, mission specific. Like you can take, you know what? They did 80 million kitty cats to train it to notice cats. But if you did not train it on a couple of Siberian cats that have a particular look, it won't recognize them at all, at all. You can take a three-year-old and show them like seven cats and they could find them all. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work to do. What the, the shortfall I think is a lot of times the, you know, the training today, you have to flatten out, you have to make rectangular data, rectangular meaning, you know, every, uh, uh, you know, every row of data is kind of fixed in length. It has one of these and one of those and one of these and one of those. 
and then you know the next row and the next row and the next row and some things like people they don't have one address they have like people on average move every five years or back in the old days before covid um and so data is more variable in its length and if you don't combine puzzle pieces into pictures and combine it it there's things that ai won't see yeah. so i think what is going to happen or needs to happen next in terms of having machines contribute more, you know, contribute more to discovery and efficiency and, 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 and finding solutions to climate change. It's going to, it's going to take being able to combine more data across a wider observation space. And I, I that's not because it needs rectangular data. It's a deficiency. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, uh, and again, this is this is another one that's way out there. It came up from someone in our team. So you've heard of deep fakes and the whole uh, big furore that that's caused. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, and I, I should have <clears throat> checked up. There, there's a term, and basically the way it works. So deep fakes is this ability to create videos that will superimpose someone's face uh, on the video. Um, and AI is basically what makes this possible. <clears throat> um, oh, deep fakes, by the way, can take your video of your face. And yeah. I could take a script with words and put it in your mouth. It's not yeah. your face on my face, on my body. It's take a video of a yes. president and put words yes. in their mouth. Okay. So, oh. thankfully, you know, so I'll just re reassure everyone. This is the real Jeff Jonas, just in case you, you think we have a deep fake and uh, someone's puppeteering it in the background. No, we've got the real Jeff Jonas here. The question I wanted to ask is, and, I, and again, we'll, I guess put in front of you is, the, the way it works is there's these two AI algorithms that they pit against each other. And the one mm -hmm. is creating the videos and the other one is trying to see if it can spot the fakes from the, uh, mm -hmm. the real oh, yeah. videos. Now yeah. that concept seems very mm -hmm. interesting because they're, mm -hmm. you're putting AI against AI. Um, you've kind of removed the human um, part from the equation and you're only limited by the things that, AI can do. So is that something do you? that, hmm. oh, go ahead, for it. Sorry. Oh, is that something just, that does it feature in any way in your technology, similar ideas where you, you're really pitting two algorithms against each other or? No, but I think that that's good to have um, dissent. There's a little bit of a, uh, you know, there's a slight similarity. If you want to improve a system, allow it uh, to, to see dissent and things that disagree. And yeah. there's, there's been a movement, especially like in master data and golden records and getting clean data, is you have to take pieces of data that don't seem true, and then you, you, you completely get rid of them. You mask them out. You go, oh, that can't be true, and you get rid of it. But what you're really doing is getting rid of natural variability and dissent. And one of the things that I've stumbled on is bad data is actually your friend. Spelling errors are your friend. Did you know when you search Google and it says, did you mean this? It doesn't have a dictionary. It just remembered everybody's errors. So if you, if you didn't remember the errors, uh, it wouldn't be so smart. And to be, it'd be specific in my systems, I have a bad daddy story. It's a pretty quick story, but I have a son with two dates of birth. I know that's kind of shocking, but what happened is he's born on September, whatever it was, uh, 2nd, but I got confused and convinced everybody, the mom, the grandparents, it was September 5th. We celebrated his birthday on September 5th for years. And his birthday, September 5th, was everywhere. Like a magazine subscription at the library, every doctor's visit. There's plenty of evidence his birthday is September 5th. Well, I ordered his birth certificate and take him to Mexico and to my surprise. His birthday's the second. Now imagine that if in any good data, high quality system, imagine after five, six years, you have 200 ev pieces of evidence that it's the fifth. And now you get September 2nd. You'd be like, oh, ha ha. And you'd throw that piece of data away. How would I have ever accumulated enough September 2nd to overweigh that? So I think systems, smart systems are able Oh, there's a famous quote by what's his name that any smart system worth two bits can hold two opposing ideas in its head. And we've done that with sensing. 
And so when you, you know, you made me think of that, you know, it's a little bit of a stretch, but when you have two systems that either disagree with each other or, or one makes a claim and the other, like, here's the thing is, if you fed the system this way, this system makes a deep fake, this system notices it and reports in and tells it what it noticed. And then this system makes a deep fake better. That would be using kind of disagreement and feedback loops to do uh, algorithmic uh, evolution. Yeah, because that is, isn't. you know, it's, it's survival, survival of the fittest. And I guess if you don't test the, the algorithm, then you're not just, you're not, you're not getting rid of the ones that don't work. Uh, so, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And then if you feed that back into the other, uh, to the, uh, if you can let your opponent see it, then, uh, yeah. And we also know that, uh, you know, one of the, the best sources of creativity is errors. So uh, if you never make mistakes, then you don't. <laughs> seems, like I, seems like I should have some humor about my three XYs. Hold on, I'm working on it. <laughs> Hold on. Nope, I'm drawing nothing. <laughs> uh, excellent. The, uh, so I don't know if we have any other questions that are coming through from Jeff. Otherwise, uh... <laughs> so we do have one other question coming through. So Jeff, what do you see being a, as the next big thing? <laughs> nice, easy one to end off on. I'd like to be able to walk around without a mask and, you know, have dinner uh, inside when it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really think if, 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 if we, I'll say mankind, can better connect data we already have in a responsible way. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. There is... Uh, research that's been done about termite mounds in Africa and how the temperature inside of them remains relatively constant all day and all night, despite the huge temperature swings. When those researchers, I'll say inadvertently or accidentally, bumped into uh, engineers working on energy efficient skyscrapers, I mean, those are two such radically different universes of people and collections of data. This is a true story. When they found each other and started discussing this, it inspired the engineers building skyscrapers on better ways to create energy efficient skyscrapers. And now there's at least two university programs studying termite mounds and, and, and learning about this. So that's an example of when machines can, uh, can help better connect like-minded people around topics that they wouldn't otherwise find each other. I think it's going to lead to extraordinary breakthroughs to advance mankind. I mean, in healthcare, in climate, energy efficiency, uh, uh, hunger, um, uh, food, um, food safety, which is going to become really a next big problem. <coughs> so it's, anyway, so it's basically, I think that's a big thing. Yeah. So, so Mother Nature's been running all those experiments for us for millennia. And so so yeah. I guess what you're saying is we... So the, the, there's a rich source of data that Mother Nature can give us that can be more widely applicable in, uh, in various ways that are useful to us. Um, and do you think if we don't listen, Mother Nature is going to slap us down? <laughs> <laughs> so I do have one last question that's come in, um, depending on how we go for time. So, so Rick's asked, is there a weighting in the system that gives more cre credence to a birth certificate? That is to a, to a data source. Some in, in our, I'll, I'll talk about our work specifically. Uh, when we're assembling a resume, we're remembering all of the bits and where they came from. So we know that these bits came from a birth certificate and these bits came uh, from something else. And so we call it full attribution. We don't choose which one was right or best, but we pass downstream all the source of the data, all the sources and all of the dates, you know, the lineage and their dates. And depending on the downstream system, if, if you're the vital record system, you probably trust both birth certificates the most. Uh, um, but if there's some other data in there where you, you know, recently registered somebody with a driver's license, maybe you'd uh, trust that the most. By the way, when I was like 17 or 18, I uh, wanted, uh, well, I wanted a fake ID so I could drink. And I learned that you could um, assume somebody's identity if you found somebody that had passed away before they were two. So I went to the library and used microfish and looked at, 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 at deaths in, and I found in the obituary uh, 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 a child that had died before the age of two. And then I ordered the birth certificate. 
And I was going to use that to go, but I could not, I could not imagine having to go stand at DMV and tell them that's me, last name Fisher. So in that case, if I had a birth certificate in my resume, that one would have been not true. So don't be fooled. All the way up to a crime, but no crime. <laughs> it's important to note. Uh, Jeff, <laughs> I mean, we could, we could keep you here all day, but I'm sure you've, um, you've got other things to get on to. So I guess that brings us to the end of our Q&A session. We'll have to um, mm -hmm. unfortunately let you go now. So once again, thanks very much, Jeff. We really appreciate you spending um, your time with us today. Uh, you did also tee up, I'll quickly mention, you teed up the topic of data lineage, which is something we'll be talking about next Thursday for those folks that want to join our sandbox discussion next Thursday. Very important topic, data lineage. So I'll thank you one last time, Jeff. Uh, thanks to our audience for joining us today. We will see you all again same time next week for our next exciting episode. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs>